Hi everyone, I'm Mary with Mary Greeley News. Thank you for joining me. I was reporting yesterday about the earthquakes they were having there by Jackson, Wyoming. When the earthquake, uh, the 7.4, 7.5 earthquake came in uh, there in Mexico. Anyways, I wanted to post some more information about the threat. Not just volcanic eruptions, but also, also earthquakes for the Yellowstone area. The information that I'm going to give to you is from several seismologists, Bonnie Pickering White, Robert B. Smith. Now, he works at the University of Utah. Uh, Stephen Hudson, Jamie N. Farrell. Now, he used to be the scientist in charge at Yellowstone who went on to um, retire, went on to about volcanic and earthquake uh, dangers. He's now working in that field. And Ivan Wong. Uh, this paper, I'll give you a link to it. It's about seismicity and earthquake hazard analysis of the Teton Yellowstone region, Wyoming. Uh, this paper was received in 2008 and made available online in 2009, August 29th. Seems like the more popular a person becomes, uh, you're targeted a lot. So I'm going to use their own documents to prove my point. Yesterday, there was a magnitude 3.6 earthquake, 16 kilometers east of Kelly, Wyoming. 100 people reported feeling this earthquake. The initial first wave of the earthquake came from the north. Uh, what's north? Yellowstone caldera. Tension was applied, it says, going east. Here's the felt reports. We got one over here in Kelly. But if you look towards um, the west, where the uh, Teton fault line um, is, we got eight responses from Jackson, 46 from Wilson, um, another four from Wilson, another nine from Jackson, another nine from Jackson, um, Tetonia, there was one, um, Alta, we got three, etc. Many of you that have followed me through the years, and I've been covering Yellowstone over the years, and we've been learning a lot together, will remember how I talked about um, the pressure, the uplift, which is the red lines that I drew out from 2015, um, the actual uplift of the ground from the Yellowstone caldera. Uh, you'll remember how I had stated how the pressure of um, the uplift of Yellowstone and its effects on different faults. And I talked about uh, the Teton Fault, how as Yellowstone rises, it shortens the Teton Fault. Uh, when the area of the Tetons um, has an earthquake, the valley floor drops and the mountains rise. Okay, the Tetons is capable um, and it's in the seismological hazard assessment. Uh, this area of Jackson is capable of having a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Between the northern and central sections of the Teton Fault, pressure has built, and they believe this is a locked zone. Um, from that paper, it, it talks about this locked zone. And they know that that stored energy is a certainty. Their hazard assessment demonstrates that the late quarterly faults of the Yellowstone hotspot, the current hotspot and past hotspots, that affects a large area of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. The late quarterly refers to a time period of 0 0.5 to 1 million years ago. These faults include the Hedgebend Lake, the earthquake that occurred in 1959. There's also a, a danger of a large fault on the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome uh, and the Teton Fault. These areas can have a magnitude 7.2 earthquake or greater. The Old Faithful live webcam has the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome in view. That is this mountain that's up behind here. Yeah, the live web camera. And to think that all those people that visit this area, there could be a possibly magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Maybe even larger. I don't know. 
but they, they figure. These authors, Robert Smith, Jamie Farrell, that a magnitude 7.2 earthquake, which would be felt over a very large area, um, could happen here and on the Tetons and in other areas. This all caused by the Yellowstone caldera. Now they also know that along the Snake River Plateau, in fact, um, it has an effect on the fault lines that run beside the Snake River Plateau. So, because we've been having all these earthquakes up here by Stanley, Idaho, I thought, okay, well, we'll measure out the distance and the location of the Sawtooth Fault Zone. Okay, so they figure that effects from the past, even today, on different fault zones that run up through the Snake River Plateau can and does have an effect today on these faults. So I measured out, it's like 50 kilometers from the Snake River Plateau um, in both directions that these old ancient hot spots still, even today, have an effect on the fault zones. 50 kilometers out from the Snake River Plateau and the faults go both north and south. So up here we have the Sawtooth Fault Line, and I measured out um, 31, uh, 31 miles, which is 50 kilometers, from the Snake River Plateau. And where does it end up? Right there on the Sawtooth Fault Line, where we've been having these earthquakes. And they keep saying that Yellowstone in no way has an effect on these earthquakes or is causing these earthquakes along the Sawtooth Fault Zone. Um, Chalice, Idaho, uh, Stanley, um, Idaho, etc. From that same document published by Robert Smith, Jamie Farrell, um, Bonnie J. Pickering White, etc. The earthquake hazard in the Teton Yellowstone region is the highest in the Uni United States Intermountain region. And it gives documentation to a paper from 2008. It is not only influenced by the lithospheric extension associated with the basin range tectonics that extends 700 kilometers west to the Sierra Nevada Mountains, California, but it has the superposition of the effects of Yellowstone volcanic source that can perturb stress up to 50 kilometers, 31 miles from the Yellowstone hot spot track, i.e., the effects of the Yellowstone hotspot uh, has a profound effect on seismicity, but not only on Yellowstone, but on the surrounding fault zones of the Intermountain region. What were the past Yellowstone hotspots? The Snake River Plain Volcanic Field right there, and it also encompasses, goes into the Teton Range. Snake River Plain Volcanic Field. What else do we have down here along the Snake River Plateau, the plain? Craters of the Moon. That was probably one of the most recent eruptions, which was about 2,000 years ago, which Native Americans still talk about. Now, there was other more recent eruptions, which they don't talk about. They only talk about um, the last major eruption, which was about 640,000 years ago. Uh, but there was more recent eruptions, which I have covered that they only recently discovered when they were surveying a road going up to a Mammoth Vault, which occurred and probably continued for a very long time, 150,000 years ago. There has been over 40 smaller eruptions since the last major eruption, and they're hoping that the next eruption would be a small one. It seems like, and it's common sense, that uh, the longer time period between eruptions, the larger they are. Okay, so we got Henry Fork Caldera marked in yellow. That was 1.3 million years ago. Uh, we got the uh, largest one here, which was the Island Park Caldera. Now that happened 2.6 million years ago. And the red line that I drew out is where the current uh, caldera hotspot supposedly is. 
Um, I just drew it out the best that I could. You can see how it comes down here by Little West Thumb. And it comes up here by uh, the Madison River area um, where I have shown you that they got uplift. Now, um, the Norris Junction has been going down where the Madison River, this area up through here, has been rising. Gardner and throughout this area is where they've only recently discovered um, yeah, the lava flows that occurred about 150,000 years ago. Like I said, there's been about 40 smaller eruptions since the last major eruption. And because, you know, the last eruption, which was small ones, um, hopefully the next eruption will also be a small one, but, you know, you just don't know. They know that magma can come up and have an eruption within 10 minutes from the plume that comes up through the earth within 10 minutes. They don't know what causes that to happen. They're hoping that if there is a volcanic eruption, um, you'll have warnings of earthquakes and uh, fault displacement and things like that before an eruption happens. But it has been well documented that eruptions can happen with little or no warning, sometimes within just 10 minutes. This has happened in Japan, this has happened in South America, etc. It's very easy to see some of the fault lines um, with the trees that grew up during what was called the quiet period of Yellowstone. And then the quiet period ended and the gases came up and killed um, the trees. You can follow along the fault line. Right now they're zooming in on, I think it's the Three Brothers um, hot pool. You can see it bubbling up there. And many of you remember the new thermal area that literally cooked the trees from the ground up. The trees that had died had fallen down and they had been turned to charcoal. You'll remember that um, last year when that report was put out. Now I had showed you evidence where this magnitude 3.6 earthquake was probably a 4.0. And a lot of people say, oh, Mary doesn't know what she's talking about. The, or the namesayers will say, I don't know what I'm talking about reporting earthquakes. When I see an earthquake on three different monitors um, across the park and they're not reporting it, yeah, um, that's pretty darn good evidence to me that they're not reporting earthquakes. Here's one example of a very small earthquake on three different monitors. This one's Norris Junction. This is Yellowstone Lake, and this here is Mary Lake. Was never reported. Another um, example, here we have Norris Junction. We got Mary Lake down here at the bottom, and Yellowstone Lake never reported. I'll bring this one over. Um, this was at 1600. Um, Norris Junction, Mary Lake. And then it would be buried somewhere there in Yellow, at Yellowstone Lake. Here's an example of an earthquake that happened in Stanley, Idaho. Okay, we got Norris Junction. It just shows up as a blob at Yellowstone Lake. And then down here at Mary Lake. This one they did report. But here's an example how sometimes um, it'll just be like a little blip or a little blob. That was a magnitude 3.5. Um, 221 Universal Time. That would have been uh, on the uh, 22nd. And 13 people reported feeling that earthquake. The naysayers will say, oh, it's noise that she's reporting. We report all these earthquakes. Well, no, they don't. But this one they did. I really don't see anything today that I could report. Um, and it's early. It's only um, not quite 10 o'clock Central Daylight Time. We do have uh, drum beats here. Yeah. And let me pull it up so I can show you the Norris Junction one. And then the uh, Yellowstone Lake, how it's similar. Magma on the move. So I did my little rant. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a great threat there. Um, yeah, from their own mouths of Jamie Farrell and um, Robert Smith and the other geologists um, of the earthquakes. 
uh, like I said, uh, eruptions of magma? Well, we just don't know. Hopefully the next one will be a small one. Um, but you don't know about that either. But people should be aware of the danger even when they visit the park. You could be there and they could have a magnitude 7.5 earthquake. Yeah, um, Hedge Inn Lake in 1959 caught them unexpectedly. Uh, 28 people died and there's, there, yeah, there's still bodies buried underneath those rocks. I'm sorry for the loss of those people. But the scientists will tell you they cannot predict when an earthquake will happen. They're not 100% positive. They can predict when a volcano will erupt. Yeah, most of the time they can, like Mount St. Helens. Um, but they did not expect it to blow out the side. Only after the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption did they learn about harmonic tremors, volcanic tremors. They did not know that as it got closer to an eruption, until the eruption happened, that the sound of the volcanic tremors got so loud that the monitors would not record what was going on. They did not know what harmonic tremors were until after the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. 57 people were killed directly, including the innkeeper, Harry Truman, who refused to leave his home there on the lake. But 57 people died, were caught unexpectedly by the eruption off the side of Mount St. Helens. Yeah, they thought it would come out the top, but it didn't. It came out the side. Magma just naturally wants to rise. It comes up through the one area that it finds as the weakest spot. Uh, and that's why I was covering the uh, earthquake swarm, what, two years ago? Um, there near Grant. Um, yeah, magma naturally wants to rise, come up to the weakest spot and that's what I believe was happening um, there at Grant with that earthquake swarm. And they, they still have earthquakes there in that area. It's an area um, that's thinner, possibly fractured. And that's why they were having the earthquakes there by Grant. They did not know until recently that there's two areas where the plume comes up for the Yellowstone caldera. One, the direction of the Snake River Plateau, and the other down there by the Gulf of California. Yeah, it's all new research. Uh, geology is probably at least 50 years behind compared to other sciences. And they're still learning a lot. So that's all I have for you right now. Any thoughts or comments or questions? Thank you for watching. Please stay safe, and I will talk to you later. God bless you all. Bye.